Sunday. This morning we are going to go ahead and get started with talking about Passover, uh, where we left off last week, and we're going to go into the Passover Seder. And as you recall from last week, Passover speaks to us as the modern day Christian of redemption. And I gave you a lot of interesting pictures. Uh, Pesach, the word, and I know I'm not pronouncing it, Pesach, Pesach, something like that, P-E-S-A-C-H. It means to literally pass over, but the Hebrew word doesn't simply mean just to pass over, it means to exempt or to spare, to have compassion, to hover over, and to guard. So in the Old Testament, when we have a picture of what we know Passover to be, we know it was the 10th plague of the Egyptians that God brought on, and he had hardened Pharaoh's heart because he wanted to do a great miracle for Israel. Yeah. So that's a statement right there. You and I sometimes wonder why stuff is so hard in our lives, and we wonder where God is. And I want to tell you, and I've told you this a couple times now, is that prepare for your blessing. It doesn't feel like a blessing when you're going through the pharaohic sort of rule where you feel like you're under oppression. But God always says that he will bring us through when we call out to him. And so they had, they, the Israelite people, had been um, in this part of Egypt, dwelling in Egypt and enslaved for about 400 years. And at the year 430 is when God leads them out on the great exodus. And that's what we associate with Passover. Now, Passover, <laughs> I told you when we were sort of towards the middle and latter third of the teaching, I used to picture it just as we read that everyone would go ahead and get shut up in the house. They would apply the, the blood to the doorposts and the lintel of the house of the lamb that they all slew. Remember, mm -hmm. it was the whole entire congregation slayed their lambs. And God made sure that everyone had one lamb per household. And if they were too small a household, I suppose if it was maybe just a husband and wife, then they would combine families and share a lamb. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, when they would get inside the house, what would happen was it said that the death angel would pass over. And if they had the blood on their doorpost, he would keep <laughs> going. Well, I have a funny story time. If they didn't have the blood on the doorpost, then the firstborn of their animals and of the humans were struck down. And that's what happened throughout the whole land of Egypt during that time. Question. Now, yes? Did they bring the animals indoors too? You know what, Chris? I don't see that they brought the animals in other than the one they slain that they ate. But no, I don't think so. But God passed over that household if there was the blood on the family's door. So I think the animals were spared. But the animals that had families, Egyptian families, or even Hebrew families, if they didn't have that blood applied, they were destroyed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I used to think of it like, wow, God, so you're like this destroyer, like Shiva, Shiva the destroyer, right? Yeah. Huh. But he's not. It says that the destroying angel, the angel of death, passed over. Yeah. Okay. So that's key, because God... Part of that word Passover means to hover over in a protective way. I want you to know in the Garden of Eden, do you remember that there was a flaming cherubim set around the tree of life? And it was to protect and to guard. In uh, Before the throne of God, it talks about the cherubim that cover it, these special angelic beings that were protecting angels. And we know in the New Testament that Jesus quotes uh, the devil quotes and says, throw yourself down from this <laughs> cliff, and it says in Scripture, in the Psalms, that the angels will guard you lest you dash your foot against the, st against the stone, right? right? That they're protective. Mm -hmm. And then it talks about the angels coming and ministering to Jesus when he goes through the 40 days temptation in the wilderness. He comes after the completion of the entire testing period. The angels come after. They are not <laughs> mentioned before or during but they are mentioned after. And then again, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying, and he's of that dual nature, he's the theanthropist, as we heard again on Wednesday, he is fully God and fully man, the only one of his kind. There's no other like him. There never will be. He was fully God, fully man, but the man part of him, his flesh, his body that could hurt, his soulish side, not the spirit, the soulish side, that didn't like the idea of a cross, because which one of us would, unless you were into pain, right? Mm -hmm. Which one was saying, 
Lord, if it be possible, <laughs> let this cup, this cup of judgment, pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, meaning my fleshly, human, natural will, but thy will be done. And we know how that played out. After Jesus said that prayer of committal and relinquishing and surrender of his will to committing to God's will, it says then the angels came and ministered to him again. So what's very interesting is we go through things, and Job too, he didn't find relief until after all of the trials. Then the family members came, then God restored him, then it says his end was greater than the beginning. So we have to keep in mind that sometimes going through some of the worst stuff, uh, like Nancy <laughs> losing Bernie, we've also seen the valiancy of Holly and different social workers and the church family rally around her to love her. That was an opportunity for people to love Nancy and for Nancy to experience God's love in another way. But yes, did it come at a time of loss or like with Elise? Yes, Bob. Um, <laughs> in, the, in the New King James, I looked that up uh, after you had taught it and stuff, was that yeah. in New King James it said that they came and strengthened him. Yes, um, amen. That, that his body was weak. Yes, you know, and, amen. Uh, they came well, to man, strengthen, which would have said to me a little bit more than minister. Yeah, know, well, ministering strength, is just a generic up. word meaning you can do it. served, served. Hoo -ha, hoo -ha, yeah. you know, that's, <laughs> come on. Right, that's right. That's right, they did. They, you were right. There's so translations that say strengthen. Yes, Frida and then Crest. Okay, I had a question. Okay. Um, the flesh part of him, uh -huh. of Jesus, uh -huh. when the devil said, and he was tempted, uh -huh. you know, this is a temptation uh -huh. time, uh -huh. and hurl yourself off this cliff, uh -huh. was he tempted in suicide? Seriously. I mean... Um, I don't see it that way. Okay. I think he was tempting Jesus to prove who he was through supernatural. Like, you know, right. do a circus yeah. trick, do a parlor trick. Yeah. Show them that you can throw yourself over. It's because we, pride. Yeah, show your pride because we know that the angels will bear you up. We know you're not going to die. So just do it. Show everybody who you are if you're the son of God. But he's like, there's no if and or buts. I am the son of God. I don't need to prove anything. That's right. See, when you are what you are and when you know who you are, you don't have to prove anything to anyone. You don't get all weird and defensive yeah. because you know who you are. Yeah. And Jesus, thank God, literally. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he knew who he was. Just like, no way. No, not su I don't believe suicide. I believe no, it was like no. to show off because it was appealing like... Right, yeah. Yes, Chris. Um, I heard a testimony elsewhere when you said, like, Nancy and such, that uh, there, there's this guy in this one church. You know, he he got injured and became unable to work and such, and uh, the church gathered around him and supported him throughout the time he was sick. And what, what the lesson he got out of that was that the church sometimes needs a reason, you know, some, someone to help, basically. Like, yeah. Like, literally... The purpose was it gave gave the rest of the people in that church something to do, because <laughs> you can't always find something to do. Like, oh, nothing's wrong. What right. To help with? Well, there's always stuff to, to, to be done. Oh, stuff to be done. Always <laughs> stuff to be done where you have a living body. But you know, Chris, like, uh, you know, I know you've done kindnesses for other people in this church. I have a uh, number of us all in here yeah. have done things. Yeah. Big, uh, all of us have done that, right? If we're Christians, all of us should be doing something kind for one another. It says that the body nourishes in uh, various parts. All the members belong to each other. And we don't like to think that. We like to think rugged individualism. We're Americans. We don't belong to anybody. It's all about me, myself, and I. And, uh, and that's wrong. In the Christian economy, God has it more like some of the uh, Mexican culture and some of the Asiatic cultures and some of the African cultures. It's supposed to be like our roots were about the family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even if it's a dysfunctional family. We yeah. talked about that, right? <laughs> we're just the same thing. We're a bigger version of our own family. Is your family, your earthly family, perfect? No. Is there a lot of dysfunction? Yeah. Are you part of that dysfunction? Probably there's parts, yeah, but that doesn't that doesn't mean we're not family. Right. And what Jesus right. wants us to understand that by the blood we are family. Yeah. But even beyond that, yeah, even beyond cool. that, it's more than just having the blood relationship. Although we do, mm -hmm. it's about having the quality of fellowship. And I've talked about that many times. Now, in other words, you could be legally married and have a rotten marriage. Yes. Right. But they're legally married. 
That's why you have Christians. They're legally married to Jesus. Mm -hmm. They've been joined to him, one spirit with him, yes. Mm -hmm. But they live miserable lives. It doesn't look any different. It doesn't look because they don't understand that the relationship, that fusing together is the beginning, just like a marriage or any other friendship or anything else. You have to nurture that thing. You right. have to Amen. spend time. You yeah. have to sacrifice. If it's going to be good, <laughs> both of you or all three of you or all ten of you or all of the church, you're going to have to sacrifice. That's what Jesus modeled for us was true love. Yeah. No greater love has man than this to lay down mm -hmm. his life for his friends. So Passover, the picture that God has now given me is that all around us, I said this last week, you have cancer that wants to attack your body. And the reason it doesn't attack your body, aside from the fact you have the Lord Jesus Christ, is because you have a thing called an immune system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is why when people's yeah. immune systems are suppressed or lowered, mm -hmm. why they contract a lot of disease, or why they have certain sicknesses, <laughs> because their immune system's been run down. It's not because they're necessarily a bad person. It's not because they didn't have enough faith. Sometimes their immune system's run That's down. Right. Well, here's the picture I want you to know, is that the death angel, so to speak, is all around us in the world. But what protects us is the blood of Jesus, and the quality of our life is not going to be determined simply by the blood of Jesus, because we know Christians that live no different than the people that don't have the blood of Jesus as their claim. And so what is the difference? It's the quality of that relationship. So all of us are saved in this room. So I know you've got the blood. But we want to get in the house, and we want to benefit from God's covering over us. Right. Because you know what? Those people still had a choice, didn't they? Yeah. They could get in the house or out of the house. Was God going to kill them? No. The death angel was. The angel of the Lord uh, says he was going to pass over, and they would be destroyed. Now, remember, Jesus said there's one that's called the destroyer. It says in John 10.10 10, that I came to give life and life more abundantly. Mm -hmm. But what does it say the devil does? Well, according to John 10.10, 10, he came to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Mm -hmm. So when you think about why does God do all this, that's not God. That's when we're outside of the house. When you're outside of God's covering, his True. umbrella, his provision, his protection, it's not God looking to thump you. It's, that, it's just like the disease. You don't have your immune system built up praying in the Holy Spirit, and you wonder why you're more susceptible, more vulnerable. Let me just put it this way. God's mighty Ruach was hovering over the face of the deep. Tom's covered that. And we had a great prayer time last night talking about the Ruach. Who and what is the Ruach? It's a Hebrew word. It means God's breath, the wind of God. The Ruach, which I did a study on this a uh, couple years ago, the Ruach, that same word, is the wind that parted the Red Sea. That Ruach, and then translated into Greek, is the same mighty rushing wind that appeared at the time of Pentecost. That Ruach is the same wind or breath that's talked about God breathed into Adam and he became a living soul. Jesus breathed upon the apostles in John chapter 20 and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. The Ruach is the same breath or wind that when God said, Son of man, to Ezekiel, speak to these bones, mm -hmm. and he did, and bone clacking started. That'd be eerie. Mm -hmm. And the bones started That's coming together. <laughs> and then sinew. And muscle and flesh. Hey, I'll tell you what. When God formed man out of the dust of the earth, he formed this body. And even Jesus said, a body thou hast prepared for me to do thy will, O God. But it wasn't a living soul. Adam was just a corpse. Adam was just a shell, a sarcophagus, until God breathed mm -hmm. into him. It says, then, then, he's just a body. Then he became a living soul. It says that when they received the Holy Spirit, that God said to them through his breath, Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Ghost. He enlivened them. They became activated for service. Um, when God breathed into the valley of the dry bones, when he breathed upon them, first of all, the prophet had to do everything God had asked him. And that was speak to the bones, prophesy over the bones, do all these different things. But then God came to the rescue, so to speak. And those things did not stand up and become a living 
you know, formidable kind of army until God's Ruach breathed on them. What is God's Ruach? You have God's Ruach living in you, and so it's do I. Spirit. It's right. the Holy Spirit. What is he? You have God's comforter. The Ruach is a comforting spirit. You have God's teacher. The Ruach will teach you of things to come and of things right. now. The Ruach is the great intercessor and advocate. He is the paraclete who comes alongside. The God-breathed part that he breathed into you should give you comfort in your time of mourning, should give you strength, because it says, Beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, you are breathing God's heavenly language back. The Ruach is the thing that will part the sea. The Ruach will come in like a flood and wipe out your enemies but part the seas for you. The Ruach is the life-giving spirit because the letter kills. The Ruach is resurrection power. The Ruach lives in you and me. It's Amen. all good things. Amen. It's quickening our mortal bodies. Yeah. Ooh. I was just going to say, the only way... It's not bursting like, to get out. The only way yes, you bursting. can allow the Ruach to rule your situation or your life is if you can beat that self man down because mm -hmm. that's the biggest battle we all face yes. every day as Christians. Every time a bad situation happens, which happens throughout the day, sure. especially yeah. in your jobs or with family, mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's that, are you going to do what God wants you to do? Or are you going to be mad and do what you want to do? It's that mm -hmm. constant battle. It's, and, and, it's, and it's a struggle yeah. to make spirit. the flesh go down. It's a struggle. It is, but that is why, you know, um, uh, well... Because the knee-jerk reaction is to do the flesh thing. It's not... That is why you have to retrain a knee-jerk reaction. Knee-jerk reaction comes from, um, sometimes we all do it, we can't help it, but the more that you discipline yourself by filling it up with the other, yes. Yes. the less prone you're going to yes. be to yes. knee-jerk yes. reaction. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it happens to all of us. You hit yourself with the hammer, you go, yes. you're going to say, ow, and hopefully not a swear word. But sometimes it happens, you know? But the more that you are in touch with the Ruach, the more the Ruach should be coming through yes. you. Yes, right. I see this is stimulating. Lots of questions and comments. Yes, Mom. <laughs> well, like you on dad said. So got a two dogs in there, but one dog's a wine and another yep. black. What the dog to you did most? That's the one want to be one. So that's what Anna talking about. It's talking about positive and negative. Sure. Whatever we most strongly uh, tended to, you know, it was more stronger. That is correct. So we know that Passover was uh, fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> He came, the whole congregation of Israel, the Romans, all of us, our sins, we killed him. That's right. And That's he right. even says, you didn't actually kill me, I laid down my life, willingly. Right. But we can't blame a people group for crucifying no. our Lord. It no. was our sins yes. that crucified him yes. and the judgment that was upon us all. Right. And it was Jesus, as Tom shared on Wednesday, who was the one and only sacrifice that volunteered for the job. Mm -hmm. None of those other innocent little lambs did. Now, Passover, we're going to move along, and I'm just going to say a quick prayer. Father, thank you this morning for those that have gathered. I pray, Lord, that we recognize the significance of you as our Passover lamb and what that means today, Lord. Thank you, Father, for presencing yourself with us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. What happened was, let's go ahead and turn right now so we have a little more context again. Let's turn to um, Exodus 12, and we're going to look at verse 42. Exodus 12, let's look at verse 42. All right, Exodus 12. 42. And Stephanie, if you have that, could you read it for us? Yes. It is a night of solemn observance to the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord, a solemn observance for all the children of Israel throughout their generation. All right. Passover was instituted to be observed for who? Children of Israel. Um, the Israelites. They're doing that, and it's an observation that we are doing this in honor of who? 
unto the they're, Lord. They're so, doing it for the Lord. That is right. And what did Jesus say when he had that heavenly Passover situation at the what we call the Last Supper? He said, do this in remembrance of who? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So the Jews that are not, that don't know Jesus, let me put it that way, because they are religious. There's a number of religious. Whether they're religious or not religious, when they're doing this, many of them, their focal point is remembering God bringing Israel out of Egypt, and it's about Egypt's, I mean, uh, Israelites' solidarity as a nation, as a people group that God has chosen specifically of God's deliverance, of their history. We must never forget who we are. We must tell this to our children for generation to generation. But Jesus came and he said, as often as you take of this, do this in remembrance of me. It's not about the table. It's not about the people around you, although you need to be in right relationship. God said, I came to bring reconciliation of the world to God, but there's more than that. Jesus didn't just reconcile us to him. He reconciled us to each other, and that's the part the church doesn't like to think about. Reconciliation is not merely man to God. The cross, because it's got both directions, it's also the horizontal relationships. It's man to man. God wants us to be at peace with all men That's right. as much as possible. Notice, right. as much as possible. Amen. To live peaceably with all men. To pray for all men, lifting right. up holy hands everywhere. I heard Bob talking. Yes, we're to pray for our leaders. Doesn't mean we agree with their stances always. Doesn't mean we voted for them or like them or any of that. But we are called to support them prayerfully right. regardless. Amen. Whether it was Obama, Clinton, Bush, or now Trump, we are called to lift them up and pray for them. The Bible Amen. says yeah. that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Well, Jesus already reconciled us. We need to bring other people in so that they too can know Jesus. But we also need to be that balm of Gilead out there in a hurting world. All right, in that same chapter, and Stephanie just read to us 42, yeah. verse 43 says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner is to eat of it, but every man's slave purchased with money after you have circumcised him, then he may eat of it. A sojourner or a hired servant shall not eat of it. It is to be eaten in a single house. You are not to bring forth any of the flesh outside of the house, nor are you to break any bone of it. Now, this is very interesting mm -hmm. because, again, we see Jesus. Mm -hmm. All yeah. right. So Jesus, interesting, because the Jews, you know what halal means? Yeah. Have you guys seen the word H-A-L-A-L -L written outside at a restaurant or at a, uh, at a butcher shop? Butcher shop? Does anybody know what halal means? Halal or something? Yeah, uh, it means the. It means I think that the um, animal has been killed in a certain way. Correct. And it faces east. Correct. And before you, yes. Uh, they pray over it before it's killed. Yes. And, and they drain all its blood out. Huh? And yes. they drain all its blood out. Yes. And there's a whole protocol now in keeping kosher. You'll see the kosher reference on certain meats and things, and it's that. But halal is the Muslim version of that. Yes, right. right. Okay, so if you go to a Lebanese restaurant, Afghan restaurant, and it says halal, it means that their religious people have done, they have killed it a certain way. All right, what Jesus did was different, you guys. I love it. Because Jesus breaks all the rules every single time. It's such a rebel. Jesus himself shed his own blood. But in the Passover, the lamb, when God talks about roasting it, he says, roast the whole lamb, even with its entrails and its head. Mm -hmm. And none of its bones will be broken, which was weird, because you are supposed to strike break its neck bone, okay? But it would be a picture of Christ, that he would enter in his whole self, a living sacrifice, choosing to die for you and I, and the blood that would come out would be the blood he willingly shed, and also, his head wasn't going to be decapitated, and none of his bones, even though the Roman soldiers came to smash his shin bones or where to make it easier to get him off the cross, 
They were about to, but they didn't. Yeah. Fulfilling the right. prophecy, Jesus is our Passover right. lamb. Right. Not a bone shall be no. broken. No. He was preserved. Amen. And the nail prints, the blood, the crown of thorns, he was being drained of blood on that cross, on that altar. Yeah. And Jesus was, was fulfilling all the righteousness of yeah. the law. Yeah. All right, so Jesus, he was a young lamb. And the reason I say young, he was in his prime. He was 30 years old. Mm -hmm. Because it said, you know, a young lamb in its first year, unblemished. And it said that it should be roasted. And the reason it said roasted was a fire would consume and burn up the lamb so that they could eat it. But roasted, the fire, is a symbol in the Old Testament and the New of judgment mm -hmm. as well as the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. depending on what you're looking at. So judgment, the judgment of our sins was upon our Passover mm -hmm. lamb, Jesus. Yes, Chris? Is that like when they said uh, uh, in the book of Judges, there's that the 70 sons got murdered and the, the youngest one was like, well, you know... Uh, let the fire come out from this person, consume them, that sort of thing. You mean for the judgment piece? Yeah, when, when the kid told the, you know, when, when they chose this uh, son of a prostitute, oh. the leader, and the oh. kid who was the rightful heir, oh, said, well, you know, prophesied that their doom was like, let fire yes. come out from them and consume them? Yes, the, because, the because fire was a symbol of judgment, so that is why um, you have the sons of thunder, James and John, saying, Lord, let's just call fire down from heaven and fry them, when, you know, the Samaritans didn't greet Jesus and give him the perfect welcome and reception. That's because fire was a type of judgment that they saw as God's judgment, allowing the fire fall, just like Sodom and Gomorrah right. when it rained right. down sulfur yeah. and brimstone. So yes, Chris, that was, they thought even if they're not being very spiritual, that's a form of judgment, right? But Jesus... He would be our Passover lamb, and he would take the judgment of us all upon himself and in his body. Now, no Passover can exist without a lamb, because the lamb is the uh, centerpiece of the whole thing. The lamb is like saying, you can't, I know some of you do it alternatively, but let's just say, okay, let's go with Thanksgiving for a minute. When you think of Thanksgiving, I know some of you do turkey. different things. It's turkey. It just wouldn't be Thanksgiving without the turkey, or it wouldn't be Thanksgiving without the pumpkin pie. Well, it wouldn't be Passover in the Jewish mind without the lamb. The lamb, without the lamb. The lamb is the centerpiece. So, um, Anna, turn for us to, um, and you can read it, Anna, but we can all turn there together. Uh, we're still in Exodus 12, but look at verse 8. I'm skipping around a little bit for what we're doing. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, mm -hmm. roast with fire and unleavened bread, mm -hmm. and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. All right, so there are three main symbolic elements, and there's others too, but the three main elements of the Passover Seder, or meal, are what? It's the lamb, who's the centerpiece. It's the bitter herbs, and it's the unleavened bread, or the matzah. Ever heard of matzah ball soup? Yeah. It's unleavened bread soup. All right. So now we're going to move on a little bit, and we're going to talk about a seder. Who heads up the seder? Well, the leader who is hosting the seder would sit at the, what's considered the head of the table, like the papa, right? And at his right side, the leader's right side would be the youngest. So now pretend we're watching, let's say we're at the Leonardo da Vinci <laughs> painting of the Last Supper as if he was there, but you know. And we're looking at the head of the table for the New Testament, who would be the leader Jesus. Of, of the, that's right, be Jesus. The youngest would be at his right hand, who would that be? John. John. Do you understand, you just learned something, now we understand the seating arrangement of the Last Supper, why it is that Jesus leaned, I mean John leaned on Jesus' bosom? He was, the youngest. he was the youngest, and he was seated close to him at the right hand. It's very important. Okay. And um, on the left-hand side, many times they, le they leave an empty seat or space or place. Does anyone know who that's for? It's an empty space. Yeah. Judas. No, not for Judas. He left, but yeah, no. Uh, no. For God. Sorry? For the Lord. That's a good. That's a good thought too. No, 
So they would leave an empty space for who? Steph, do you know? Say it again, step louder. That's what I was going to say. Yes, it's, it's what Stephanie and what Frieda are saying. It's for Elijah. You know oh. why? And they do it to this day. They're still looking for him. And remember, John the Baptist came and said, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. And, and people said, Well, we know the Messiah can't come until Elijah first comes. And Jesus said, I tell you, he's already come. Oh, I just felt yes. the anointing all over that. <laughs> because John the Baptist was the New Testament revelation right. of Elijah. Right. They're still waiting for him because they believe Messiah can't come until Elijah right. has first come. Right. In the New Testament, we know that John the Baptist was the messenger that came, saying, preparing mm -hmm. the way of the Lord. So at the right hand of the head of the table is the youngest family member. In this case, in the New Testament, that would be John, the Beloved. The one who leaned on Jesus' yeah. bosom and said, Lord, tell us which one is going to betray you. Remember, right. Peter said, hey, John, right. you're sitting close to him. You ask him. All right. Now, um, here's the scene you have. They have this table set. I've already told you who's on the left, an empty seat for Elijah. Mm -hmm. Who's on the right of the leader? That's the youngest, mm -hmm. in this case, John. And then they start this very long service, and it goes for hours if it's done according to Jew Jewish um, law. And what it is, is it's not merely a recounting of Passover, but it's about the whole nationhood of Israel from the calling of Abraham by God Whoa. to come out of Calvi to be with him, all the way up until the Passover. And so they have many readings, many prayers, things that are recited, but here is one thing that happens is there's the lighting of the candles, and the first lighting of the candle, the mother of the house ushers in the holiday by lighting the Passover candles. Then she covers her eyes with her hands and recites the following Hebrew blessing over the candles, thanking God for this occasion. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has set us apart by his word, and in whose name we light the festival lights. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you, does that not give you the heebie-jeebies? I'm not a Jew. That's what the Jews do to this day. I told you last week that more Jews, religious or unreligious, celebrate mm -hmm. Passover. Mm -hmm. There's 67% that celebrate Passover, and less than, like there's 46% that actually attend synagogue. So Passover is even more important to them than attending synagogue and identifying with their nationhood, their cultural identity, where they came from, they always say the words, never forget. Never forget who you are. That's why when a Jew is converted to Christianity, it's super, hugely a big deal because their mother and their father will literally say to them, you are now dead to me. Mm -hmm. And they will write them out of wills, mm -hmm. act like they're not even alive, mm -hmm. because that's how ingrained they are as a people. That it's not just a mere, oh, I'm just doing a different religion. It's a whole lifestyle for them. You have to understand, it embraces their national identity, their culture, um, everything. And uh, it was very interesting when I worked with Jewish lawyers. This whole office was Jewish, except for a couple of us uh, legal assistants. They liked that I understood that, and they helped me to understand, do you understand I'm a Jew and it's not because I go to synagogue? And I said, yes, I understand that. Uh, it's, it's a whole lifestyle for them. Wow. Now, I want to say this for you and I. Christianity, it shouldn't just be something we do on Sunday no. or yes. Wednesday. Right. It should be a lifestyle. Yes. The same way that the yes. Jews do it, right. we should do this for yes. in our way of thinking. Yes. It's not just because I go to church or because no. I was baptized no. and, I, and I'm born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. I should have a lifestyle that says my whole life yes. is is engulfed by this. Now, they do it, and they do it from a very religious, legalism standpoint, but we should do it from a place of saying, my whole life should be marked with the marks of Christianity, which are love and loving one another. Jesus didn't just say, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. He said, and the second commandment is like it. Love thy neighbor as thyself. A lot of us love ourselves, but we don't love our neighbor like ourselves, because if we did... We wouldn't be so so selfish. We wouldn't be so self-aware. We'd be a little um, excuse me. We'd be a little more self 
less instead yes. of self-ish. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Wait, I have a question. Yes. But still, shouldn't they be going to synagogue if that's what their life is? No. They, well, that, no, that I mean, no, because Vicki, for them, the synagogue is an afterthought for some of them. It's about observing the high holy days of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Passover, which is Pesach, and uh, Purim. They have their festivals, and that's kind of like, okay, it's like the Catholics. I'm born a Catholic, but the only time I show up at church is Easter and Christmas. Yeah. Same kind of thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Same kind of notion. Yes. Bob. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about what you just said about love thy neighbor as yourself. Yes. We have to take on a split personality there because if I loved the neighbors as myself as the flesh, I probably would have ran them over and hung yes. them or shot them. Because, because I love myself so much. Okay, so, you know, so I have to take on the spirit to go yes. love my neighbor. Well, of course, we you know? are. So, uh -huh. we, we okay, Bob. I, I got to talk to you about that because I agree. But Bob, that's, that's the first thing. One of the first things, and it's hard for me too, because the way my temperament was, and I'm learning to embrace it. Yes. I'm learning to love myself. And I don't mean love myself, like, oh, love myself. I mean, narcissistically. Under, yeah, not like a narcissist. But I'm learning God, and it just brings tears to my eyes every time. You love me. Yeah, even mm -hmm. broken up. Even when I just was a crappy acting person, or even when I did it wrong, or or even when I'm not always polished up, shiny and new, yeah. and yeah. you know, like shiny, happy people, like the REM song. I'm not a shiny, happy person sometimes. But you know what? That shows you what age I am, right? I just located myself. But God says, I love you, just like some of you who have children. You're not loving your kid because your kid... Especially, let's take it when your kids were innocent and really, really little, okay? I know some of you and your kids have kind of gone wayward. But when they're really little, they didn't do anything to earn your love except that they, were, they came from you. Mm -hmm. And you love them because of blood, blood relation, mm -hmm. right? Well, God, unlike us as parents, where when the kids get to be preteens, tweens, and when they're teenagers and they get to be real well, buttheads and we don't like them and all that, <laughs> all the way till they're about 35, 40, <laughs> uh, God loves us when we're in that awkward right. adolescent phase. Right. God loves us when we're a middle-aged person going through menopause. God loves us when we're a guy having a midlife crisis. God loves us when we got pimples on our face. God loves us. And that is the most important revelation that I think Pete Cabrera in talking about identity of self that my husband had Amen. to learn too. Amen. Because a lot of us don't realize we have a lot of self-hatred. And if you got a lot of that going on, you are going to project that body. I, right. I, I had a lot of it. Going yes. On. Yeah. And so to so, go against that and to embrace yeah. that it's not about how good I am or how well I perform, yes. Yes. then guess what? The irony is you will begin to be more loving. That's right. You do begin to relax. You do see stuff that frustrates you and you're more willing to let go Amen. because you understand your love. Yes. And you understand that God loves you. So now the mama, we know who's at the head of the table. It's the father of the family or whoever is sponsoring the Seder. The mama at the table lights the candles and she says that little prayer. And then we have the four cups of Passover. Now, there are four cups of Passover, and they tie to Exodus 6, verses 6 and 7. Let's look now. You're not far from there. You're in Exodus 12 right now. Let's turn to Exodus 6, verses 6 and 7. And uh, let's see. Who would like to read that for us? Bob? Okay. Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. We're talking about Passover. Go ahead, Bob. Therefore, say to the children of Israel... I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people, and I will Amen. be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And um, also, yeah, okay, that's it. That's it, Bob. Thank you. Uh, I want you to know, here's another learning thing. Passover has four cups of wine, and they tie it to the verses that Bob just read. Exodus 6, 6 and 7. Listen to the four I will statements. I will bring you out. I will rescue you from bondage. I will redeem you. 
And last, the best one of all, I will take you as my people. So contained in those two verses, this is where the Jews derive the celebration that incorporates in their Passover Seder the four cups of wine. Isn't that beautiful? It's based on the fact that God says, I'm going to bring you out. I'm going to rescue you. See, it's not just good enough to be brought out. I, sometimes we all want to be rescued. Be honest. I know if you're a girl, it's easier to identify with this example. You're waiting for the knight in shining armor to rescue you. I've got news for you. No one is coming. I found it one right. No one is coming. No one is coming. I went to a work seminar one day, and they talked about being a victim. And it was a work seminar that I had to go to many years ago in downtown Seattle. And it was about finding your place in your workplace and, and becoming a leader. And they said, the first thing, the victim mentality, you have to throw it away. This society conditions you to be a victim. Stop being a yes, victim. Yes, because yes. what this guy told us in the seminar was, no one's coming. Exactly. No one's coming. You got I just want my kids to do this. I just want my husband to do that. I just want my mother to do this, my father to do that, my pastor, my teacher, my mentor, my best friend. No one is coming. Because he already came. His name is Jesus. And the Ruach, the life-giving spirit, the teacher, the comforter, the lawyer, the, the, the prophet, he has come. The one that quickens your mortal body, he has come like a mighty rushing wind. He's the one, the mighty Ruach, that can take your dry bones and make you a soldier. Amen. He's the Lord that can take you that some days feels like you're just a corpse. And he can make you, through his life-giving spirit, Amen. to stand upon your feet a living soul. His Ruach is the thing that takes you from a scared baby shivering in an upper room, afraid to do anything for God. When his spirit came, they were so excited, they were so empowered, they were so infused that they couldn't help but go out and testify of him. That is who you have. He has not just brought you out of the land of darkness and translated you into the kingdom of his dear son, but he has brought you, he has rescued you, he has redeemed you. That's the third statement, I will redeem you. You know what? That means you're worth it, Bob. That's right. It means yeah, Paul is worth true. it. Amen. It means Nancy's Amen. worth it. It means yes. Matthew's yes. worth it. And Amen. whoever you might be thinking isn't worth it, let me tell you, and this is controversial, but Pastor Tom agrees with me, Jesus is the light that lights every man that Amen. comes into the world. That's right. That's every right. man. That's right. You know, I'm just going to tell you, she's not here today, or she would raise her hand and say this is my friend Gail. She's very much Calvinistic in, in some of her beliefs, but she's not really as hard as she thinks she is about that. Because she's I, a little moldable. She's moldable in the sense that she said to me with her she's own moldable. mouth, Paula, I agree with you. I don't believe in limited atonement. Hallelujah! Limited atonement says that God calls only those that were going to be saved no, no, and that those are a set number of people. Baloney! It says he lights every man that comes into the world. Every man was every born. man, every homosexual, every whoremonger, every hypocrite. I'm gonna just talk to the Christians. Every hypocrite, every liar, every weak person, every person, every good person, every person he put that light in us. And that every man be saved. And not every man will be saved, but he says, whosoever will, let him come. Right. Jesus did not right. say, only you. I got something to tell you, and I said it last week, and God gave it to me, and my mom was like, hallelujah. I said, mom, okay, I want you guys to be really real about yourselves and each other now. And I'm just okay. Yeah. Yeah. Are there ever days where you come and go, well, no one inspires me. Sure. You ever had that bad, crappy little attitude sure. that says, I don't feel like I had church? I got news for you. Jesus said, he had a feast going on, and he invited the people from the highway. People, the no, he invited pretty uh, high esteemed yep, people to come, come, and they made excuses. They didn't come. I am getting married. I got to go take care of my parents. I am trying a new yoke of oxen, and the master got upset. So he told his servants, "Go and beat the bushes." 
Amen. Go to the highways and the byways and compel them. That means yeah. kind of force them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That my house might be full. Yeah. we got to stop praying these prayers of, oh, God, bring us this sanitized, nice little Christian person. We need those too. But what God said is, if the ones that I call don't come, just bring anybody in. That is who we are. So why are we surprised to get family when we have dysfunction? Because you all just admitted earlier, except for maybe Teresa and Matt who missed this question, but I think they'll agree. Which one of us comes from the family that's 100% functional and whole? I'd like you to raise your hand. Because you need to repent. Oh no, Chris, no. Well, why is it you come to church with the unrealistic expectation that it's all functional and whole, including your pastor. You think he came from a functional whole background? He cleans up pretty well. She cleans up pretty well, but no. We got the, the crazy... I got the crazy brother-in-law that went to Vietnam and has a real murderous kind of spirit, and he's a little bit psycho, and he makes me uneasy to be around. Okay? We all have the people in our lives. Yeah. And the thing is, God knew that. Mm -hmm. And that's why with even his apostles, he called a tax collector. Amen. And he called a couple of blue-collar stevedores, some fishermen, some longshoremen. Right. And he called one that he knew would be a total traitor. And he took Peter, who he knew would be a big mouth, and he took, mm -hmm. oh, I know. Some of you are going, what about the beautiful James and John? What about them? They're the sons of thunder. They had a temper. J.R. taught that many years ago. The loving John was the one that says, go fire down from heaven and fry him, Jesus. He was right. one of the ones, sons of thunder. Right. That means he was passionate. He was not the little milk toasty, only lean on Jesus' bosom kind of guy. He was young and he was fiery. Okay? He called Thomas. Who was a doubter? And don't forget Mary Magdalene. And all the others from time immemorial, yeah. Ruth, the Moabitess, yeah. Mary Magdalene, Bathsheba, she's mentioned. Yeah. And Jesus is trying to show us, why are you looking for the church to be perfect? It's not, because no, you're there. I'm there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, God gave me a vision of this uh, a few days ago, because I go through these times where I, I do the murmuring and complaining of why are there so many weirdos in my life? <laughs> you stop doing I mean, that. They're there for so, reason. Uh, and then he gave me this vision. Probably he used this vision because I, you know, I used to collect rocks and I like the gemstones and all that. And he said the people that he brings into church, if you want to call the people on the highways and the bios, he said they're like rough rocks. Right. And we're polished. put into a tumbler, and yeah. they all hit up against each That's other. That's right. right. And I mean, and it, and it gets right. scratched up and beat up, but yeah. when it's done, they're all shiny and polished and pretty. That's shiny, right. happy people. But, <laughs> he, but he puts us in as these rough, That's rough right. looking rocks, and they're in the, we're in the tumbler together. Precisely. So that means there's going to be interaction, and it isn't always going to be pretty. But that's part of the the process right, of being hey. righteous and holy. So it's moving along, that's right. So moving along in the Passover Seder, we've said the prayer, and oh, I forgot to say, and we're washing our hands. Yes. We're washing as a symbol of purity. Okay. And we're taking this first cup of wine, which the leader lifts up to heaven, and he recites the kiddush. Kiddush is a prayer of sanctification to set the day apart to God. And this is what he says, the Kiddush, that's a Hebrew word, the first prayer that he says. Remember, the mama says a prayer when she lights the candle. Now, the leader, he says, Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who created the fruit of the vine. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, who has chosen us for thy service from among the nations. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has kept us in life, who has preserved us and has enabled us to reach this season. Mm -hmm. Now, as Christians, Jesus said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me, this cup of remembrance, we are called to service. Now, let's look at Luke 22, 17. And uh, who would like to read that? Luke 22, 17. Okay, Teresa, Luke 22, 17. Okay, um, and he took the cup and he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. Wow. All right, Jesus is the head of the table, that he's fulfilling what they had done ever since Egypt. He passes that first cup of wine. Now, 
We know that with the washing of the hands, the servants would bring a water bowl and towel to each person because now they're going to partake of the meal. Mm -hmm. They had their first cup of wine. And as he's going, we know that the washing of the hands is purification. We can all agree with that, right? Right. But Jesus did one better. You already know, John chapter 13. Um, Stephanie, could you read for us John 13, 4 and 5? And let's see what Jesus did. Did Jesus have a servant go around to each one and wash their hands? No. You want to be great in the kingdom of God? Jesus said, be the servant of them all. That's right. Amen. Being great is not having the best seat at the table. Amen. It's showing yourself that you're so secure in who you are that you're willing to serve everyone. Amen. When you get to that place, you'll know you're closer to that place. I'm learning that about myself, too. It's less about you don't care if the people see it as much as you want to be it. And that means I don't care what it is. If it's cleaning the bathroom, teaching a class, helping out with whatever, it does not matter as long as I'm useful to God. And that's how we Amen. should see it. Amen. That's how we should see it because that's what Jesus did. He did the servant's job. Stephanie? Right. Jesus rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. All right, in Passover setting, they would wash the hands and they would send a servant who would rise up and go from person to person to wash their hands. Jesus did one better. He washed their feet. Yeah. He took the lowest position. He's the head of the Passover, the head of the Seder meal. He was demonstrating for you and I, none of us are too big to be Sir. humble enough to wait on each other. Amen. Yeah. And he washed each one, the betrayer, the denier, the doubter, the tempers. The, all of them would forsake him and flee and take off. All those. You say people are flaky. Where? Yeah, Jesus yeah. had 12 of them with him, and he still did it. Mm -hmm. Because, again, it's not incumbent upon the object of your love. It's that you have God's love. Amen. It does not matter the who as much as the who inside of you showing through. So you say, well, they don't deserve it. Well, of course they don't. You didn't either. So what? You clean up better today? What would have happened if you lost everything and were out on the street? Amen. Say it. That's what I'm saying. Jesus did it for every single one of them. Now, then they bring on a thing after the washing of the hands. Jesus was showing them that the servant would wait upon those that he came to serve are the very people that should be waiting on him. Jesus demonstrated true servanthood. Then they take, after the hands are washed, this thing called, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it correctly, karpas. And it means green vegetable. And in a Passover Seder, many times it's parsley. Sometimes not. A lot of times it's parsley. But it's a green vegetable. And it's a reminder to the Jews that Passover takes place in the springtime. And they will take that parsley, and there's a little dish on the table, it's salt water. And they will dip that little green vegetable in salt water to commemorate the time of year that Passover took place, springtime. Mm -hmm. And also the salt, salt water, is a picture of their tears. Their right. tears for their suffering in Egypt. All right? So they would take this green vegetable and dip it in the salt water. Then the next thing that would happen, and I love this, the leader will take a linen bag that's got the unleavened bread in it. And the unleavened bread is divided into three sections, we'll say. And this is so funny what the rabbis say. They say, well, that's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm -mm. Sounds good. Okay. Another one says it's... Uh, Another group of rabbis say, well, it's the Jews, the non-Jews, and then the people that would later be converted or that are outside. Okay. But what, what happens next in their own feast, given those interpretations, does not make sense. Because at this point, the leader takes the middle matzah, or unleavened bread, from the linen bag, and he breaks it in half. Yeah. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, one of those had to be broken in half. Nope. The Jews, the Gentiles, and the later would-bes, one of them's got to be broken in half. Doesn't make sense. What does he do? He breaks it in half and replaces one half in the linen bag where it came from, mm -hmm. 
and the other half he wraps in a napkin and it's hidden. Wow. Ooh. Who do you think represents that middle? Oh, I'm feeling the anointing all over this. Is Jesus. Yes, Chris. Wouldn't be, wouldn't be like uh, the sin nature being broken off a man and the other part being hidden in Christ or something? You know, I could see that, Chris. No, that could work. That could totally work. But look at it, too, as like this. It's half God and half man. Well, see, now, don't say that, Teresa. Never, never say that. You're going to get yourself in a theological war. Well, I mean, you can never say he's half. You've got to say he, it doesn't make math sense. He's, he's full man. this and full that. Yeah, yeah, full this, but he's full yeah. this, but there's right. the two components. Right. Yeah. A lot of people like to say that. And so, um, and that, and that... I can go with that. There's nothing contradictory about what you and Chris said. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But what they did was they would hide it away in a linen napkin, mm -hmm. and later children would find it as hide and seek as part of the Passover Seder. Jesus. Now, this piece all of a sudden takes on significance. The piece that's not put back in the bag that's wrapped in a linen napkin and hidden, mm -hmm. it's called the afikomen. A F. I K O M E N, Afikon. And I said, I gave you the teaser last week. It's the one Greek word that shows up in all Hebrew, Hebrew language Passover. And the Jews, it's after Christ. Because when they celebrated Passover, they didn't have this feature. But where were the first Christians from? Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The first believers were Jewish. That's it. So, could it just be that this practice of the afikomen was adopted as a response to Jesus? Amen. Because the Jews can't explain it to this day. Why is it that the rabbis will say, well, it's just something we do to signify and to give the children something to do? Right. Okay, fine. But you know what? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, one's being broken. You guys are so symbolic. That doesn't mean, that doesn't carry through very well. Uh, oh, it's the Jews, the Gentiles, and the others, people groups? That doesn't make sense. Unless you want to say the Jews were broken, but why is half of it hidden? No, that's not true. It's Jesus, the Avi Komen. What that simply means in Greek, and they don't get it, it means I came. Amen. <laughs> I came. Sounds a little crazy. I came. Because it says he's hidden. He's hidden their eyes. It says the God of this world has blinded their eyes as they right. see the truth. Well, at least they know they hidden. Yeah, so half is hidden in the napkin. The rabbinic tradition, they said also it could be the Levites, the priests in Israel, the non-Levites and priests in Israel. Okay, it doesn't make sense. But we know the Avi Komen is Jesus. He was wrapped in linens and laid in hidden, tomb. so to speak, yeah. in a tomb. Only to show up later. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. By his children. Right. Yes. By his children. By his so children. Discovered later by his children or his Amen. followers, his disciples. Now, the next thing to happen in the service is that the youngest child, that would be John, yes. in this case, the youngest sitting in his right hand, is called on to recite their diligently rehearsed part that they take out of Exodus 12, 26. When your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? That's what's found in Exodus 12, 26. This is what the children say. And I love this because I've seen it on The Simpsons. I've seen it, you know, I know they've done all kinds of parodies on this, but now you know where it comes from. It comes from Passover. Everybody thought it was for Hanukkah. It's not Hanukkah, it's for Passover. What is the, why is this night different from all other nights? On all other nights, we eat either leavened or unleavened bread, but on this night, only unleavened bread? On all other nights, we eat all kinds of herbs, but on this night, only bitter herbs? On all other nights, we do not dip even once, but on this night, we dip twice. Do you remember? Jesus said, whoever dips with me, mm -hmm. that's the betrayer, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. On all other nights, we eat either sitting or reclining, but on this night, we eat reclining. You know what? The picture of people in chairs is wrong. That's our culture. Right. That's the Renaissance. That's Leonardo. That's Italy. Mm -hmm. Okay? They had like cushions and they literally would recline on an elbow towards the leader. If I was if he's here, I'd be this way. If he's here, I'd be this way. They reclined on these cushions. It was a different custom. They weren't all seated in chairs. You know, in Korea, in um, Africa, the people weren't all sitting in chairs when they were eating. It was supposed to be a time of communion. 
which means fellowship and communication, right? So they um, have the child ask the questions, and that is why it's very significant in John 13, 23, it says, now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. This would indicate that John sat to the right of the Savior and was the youngest at the meal, a position consistent with early church tradition that John was the youngest apostle. John would have had the honor of asking the questions that night. That is why, oh my gosh, I feel the anointing all over us. Oh, thank you, Jesus. That is why when we say to Peter, what a wimp, why did he ask John to ask Jesus right. who is the betrayer, who's right. the one that's going to betray right. him? Right. Peter was doing the right thing. First of all, John was closest to him in proximity. Uh -huh. Remember, chair for Elijah, right. then the next disciples, next John. So Peter's like, hey, John, we know he loves you. You're right there. And you're the one that's going to ask the questions, the four questions. Ask him. Who is it going to be? It makes sense now, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Now does it make sense? Why? Okay, so then what happens after that, the four questions, they take the second cup. Remember the four statements. I will bring you out. I will rescue you from bondage. I will redeem you. And I will take you as my people. The second cup of wine is poured. And they do at this point, this is where they do the long storytelling. This is where they talk about Israel's beginnings from the call of Abraham to the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. And then they go into the ten plagues of Egypt. And, and then they recite, I, know, I kid you not, Psalms 113 to Psalms 115, which is the first half of the Hallel, H-A-L-L-E-L. -L -E -L. And then they drink that second cup of wine. And the reason that's important to you is the halal is where we get our word hallelujah. It means praise. They're giving a praise. Do you notice they're giving thanks? Jesus says, whenever you take this cup and do it in remember, he says, give thanks. When Jesus broke the bread and gave them the cup, he gave thanks. There's yeah. always a praise involved. Remember, there's always a sacrifice noted in every feast. There's also a praise element, a thanking element. And so Jesus said, we need to be thankful. And of all people, he knew that he was going to be the sacrifice. And he still serves them, washes their hands. He's the one leading the meal. He's the one leading them in the song service, the worship. And they do the first half of Psalms 113 through 115. And I did this in a lesson before is on Wednesday night, is that the Hallel has many messianic references in it. Go home this week and read Psalms 113, 114, and 115, and you will see many prophetic scriptures in those psalms talking about the Messiah, okay. how the cornerstone is going to be rejected, mm -hmm. uh, about Jesus says that they are going to treat him coldly. Those are found in those psalms, yeah. and there's other yeah. psalms besides, yeah. but those. And Jesus did this all knowing what he was going to go through, and he still led with dignity and with honor and with love. Next comes uh, another um, key feature, and that is the dipping of the matzah. Everybody who would wash their hands for a second time now, and the upper matzah and the remainder of the middle matzah that were in the linen bag, those are now broken into pieces, like we do our communion, and distributed to everyone. Remember, that little half middle piece is still hidden away. Mm -hmm. So, these other pieces, they're broken up, and each person must eat, eat a piece of this matzah, and they dip it in what's called the chorosset. And I'm pronouncing it horrible, I know. I need no, that's, that's pretty close. Okay. The chorosset. <laughs> the chorosset is um, H-A-R-O-S-E-T, and it means horseradish and usually honey. Mm. Now, they use some, uh, there's, a, there's a spice element, very hot element spice, and then there's the sweetness, and it's called the chorosset. Okay. And uh, the nickname they have for it is what? Let's see. If, do you know what it's called, the nickname that the Jews call it? They call it the Hillel sandwich. Hillel meaning <laughs> Rabbi Hillel. Because Rabbi Hillel had said that you have to have this sort of, um, let's see, where does it have? The Hillel sandwich, named in honor of the brilliant and revered first century rabbi who taught that enough of the bitter herb should be taken to bring tears to the eyes. Wow. 
Uh -huh. So like horseradish wasabi, let's say, right? Uh -huh. In this way, each participant then can personally identify with his forefathers on the bitterness of being slaves in Egypt, yeah. and then the honey is the sweetness of them being delivered out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Like my mom would say in um, in Korean culture, the good and the bad side by side, right. that's for all set. You're gonna have the Hillel sandwich, you're gonna take the matzah, and you're gonna put in it enough dipping of the horseradish, or hot yeah. place, with the honey, and, and you can't be a wimp, you gotta have enough of it to where it brings tears to the eyes. To remember the bitterness. It was a tangible expression for them to be able to recall what bitterness they came out of. So that they could be thankful for the sweet, right? Mm -hmm. The sweetness of redemption versus the bitterness of slavery. Sometimes you and I don't appreciate our salvation because we forget yes. the mighty long way that God yes. has brought us from and where Amen. we were. Yeah. And sometimes we need that reminder. Mm -hmm. That is why in John 13... Mm -hmm you find that Jesus has them dip the bread. And that's part of this Seder meal. He was fulfilling that. And then he, give, he distributes the bread to all of them. Then the dinner. The dinner, <laughs> they have a picture because Jews nowadays, they don't always do a lamb. They may do turkey. So it says a traditional Passover meal today may include delicious Jewish dishes. Like, okay, I don't like this one, good to fish. Matzo ball soup, I love that. that Glazed good. chicken, matzo nut stuffing, potato kugel, honeyed carrots, stewed fruit, and sponge cake. All right. So the dinner would be served. In the day of Jesus, it would have consisted of the roasted lamb with the bitter herbs and matzo, the unleavened bread. And isn't it fitting that, um, that Jesus himself, being the Passover lamb, is there in their midst? All right, so next in line is they take the fourth, or excuse me, the avikomen. So now at this point, after eating the main meal, they send the little one out to go find, to search high and low, to find that napkin with the half of the middle matzah. Mm -hmm. And the children, they get it, and they get a reward, some kind of goodie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now it could be a, a yummy goodie, or it could be maybe a little toy or something. And mm -hmm. rabbinic law requires... Listen to this. This is rabbinic law, not Christian. Rabbinic law requires that a small piece of that afikomen be broken off and eaten by everyone present at the service as a reminder of the Passover lamb. Wow. Oh. <laughs> Do this in remembrance of Jesus. He's discovered, I like the way Chris said it, by his children, yeah. his followers. It's an empty tomb. Jesus isn't wrapped in the napkin. He's not in the linen cloths anymore. He's risen. But before he left, he made sure that they partook of the last Passover Savior. Isn't that our God? He's so wonderful. Now is the third cup of wine called the cup of redemption. It was here that Jesus is instituting what we call the cup of the Lord's Supper. And it says that uh, it's with this cup that they are forward-looking towards Messiah's return, Amen. the redemption. Remember, I will redeem you, yes. that third statement. Mm -hmm. The I will redeem you, they're still looking for him. Yeah. We know we're taking that drink now, the cup of wine, saying we remember what you did. They're saying we're mm -hmm. waiting for you. He's saying, we're saying we thank you for what you did. Mm -hmm. And it says that the tradition is rooted in the Hebrew scriptures for Malachi prophesied, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, Malachi 4, 5. But Jesus said, I, I, behold, I tell you, Elijah has already come. Yes, he did say that. Yeah. John the Baptist. Yeah. So what happens is, they're waiting, they take this third cup of wine, and a child is sent to the front door to welcome Elijah. It's a tradition, they still do to this day. They run to the front door, and they open it, and they look here and there to see if Elijah has come. And it's hoped that the prophet will step through the doorway, drink his cup of wine, because remember they have an extra place setting for him, right. and announce the coming of Messiah. And it's rooted in Malachi 4 or 5, that before that great and dreadful day of the Lord, I will send Elijah. Well, Jesus said Elijah's already come. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And uh, now is the fourth cup of wine, I will take you as my people. The fourth cup of wine is called the cup of acceptance. 
for praise. Amen. Isn't it wonderful that God took us to himself? He said, you didn't love me, but I loved you. Yeah. He goes, here's love demonstrated. Not that you loved me, but that I loved you and I gave my life for you. Mm -hmm. So the fourth cup of wine, the cup of acceptance, or the cup of praise, is poured and taken. And it was this cup that, where Jesus said he would not drink again mm -hmm. until he drank it with his disciples in his kingdom, Matthew chapter 26, mm -hmm. verse 29. Yeah. He knew that the hour of his acceptance by the yes. Jewish nation would be in the future. Mm -hmm. And therefore, his joy would not be full until then. But in the meantime, we as Christians, yeah. we can enjoy that now. We know we are, quote, right. accepted in the beloved. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Amen. And then the last thing is that uh, they would have a closing hymn. And in Matthew 26, 30, it says, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out. So, the Seder always ends with the last half of that thing I call the Hallel, the Hallelujah, the praise. Mm -hmm. And that's Psalms 115 through 118. So, the first half of the music that they sing is Psalms 113 through part of 115. The last half is after the whole meal is that's one, the latter half of 115 all the way through 118. Mm -hmm. So, Psalms 113 through 118 in its entirety represents the great Hallel, where we get our word hallelujah from, and Jesus led them in that hymn before they left the Savior, and then they went out to the mountain. And that would conclude the service. Now, in those verses, like in Psalm 118, one of the verses, it says, the stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Mm -hmm. This was the Lord's doing. Who rejected them? The people, but it was the Lord's doing. Mm -hmm. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Messiah sang these words just hours before he fulfilled them, going to his trial and to the cross. So amen. That, I hope, amen. helps give you an idea of Passover Seder and I didn't go as detailed as I could, but I think enough to give you an overview right. of what it looks like. Yes, Vicki? The first part of Psalms 113 through the first part of 115 is the halal, the hallelujah. The first half of yes. it. What is the 15 through 18? It's the second half of the halal that okay, they do so at the conclusion. Okay. So, so they break it up because so, okay. it's so much scripture. Oh, okay. <laughs> and because they've already, Vicki, remember at the third cup, they're already sure. doing the whole ever since sure. I called okay. Abraham all the way to the giving of the law, the ten plagues, mm -hmm. and all that. So that's quite a bit of history and readings right. that they disseminate. Mm -hmm. So there it is, class. Um, now remember, Passover is about redemption, but next week we're going to talk about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And in Judaism today, many of the Jews lump those two together and make it a seven-day if you're in Israel. If you're outside of Israel, it's eight-day feast, and they call the whole combined thing Passover. But Passover, for our purposes, is the Passover lamb and the Seder and all that, and it's followed by the seven days Feast of Unleavened Bread, another spring festival. So we're going to focus on how Jesus is the unleavened bread and what that means to you and I and how the Jewish celebration of it we can find fulfillment here in the New Testament. Amen. Amen. I hope you learned something. I hope yes. that's exciting. Yeah. 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 Help you understand some of the weird stuff we don't understand. Why did they do this? Why did well if you understand some of the background it helps us to appreciate the Bible whole yeah. So um, Stephanie can I have you close us in prayer? Father, we just come before you with a grateful hearts, Father, for your great plan of redemption that we can see from the beginning and the end of your word. Father, we thank you today for blessing us with the uh, words and the teaching that Paula gave to us. Uh, feed our hearts with that word, Father. Let yes. us see you in what she taught us today. And Father, we just lift up Pastor Tom and the services for yes, today. Lord. And we thank you for your strong hand upon him as he speaks and also upon every person here in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.